Good morning, church. Welcome to the Lord's house this morning. Let's stand and sing our praises together.
Well, good morning. Our announcements for this morning, our first church, here is that we have our connection card, and if you'd be willing to fill that out so that we know that you're here, and also ways that you can participate or want to participate in our, way, in our different services or our different ways of outreach, and also their prayer requests are on the back. Um, so that's all of the stuff that's there. So holiday outreach, see the card on the inside of your bulletin. And so if you'd be wanting to be a part of the different services and the things to do, um, here's, here's the, they are all listed. And on the back of that, just FYI, is the poinsettia order. So if you would want to order a, po po mm, a poinsettia, in honor or in memory of someone, it's right there. So, um, and there are other ways that you can be a part. If you would like to make an Advent wreath after worship this morning, there's material down in the um, social room. And so you could go downstairs and make a um, large one. There's a little tiny cute one too. So you can come and make um, Advent an Advent wreath. Uh, Mom's Day Out is going to be on um, December the 2nd from three, or from noon to 3, and children's team will offer snacks and movies and games while you complete your holiday duties. Um, just sign up on the connection card. Also, if you don't want to complete holiday duties or just take a nap, you can do that too. Volunteers are needed after the second service on Sunday, December the 3rd to help get out the trees and the wreaths and other decorations from up in the tower room. So we will need your help. If you can help with that, please write that on the connection card and stay to help us, please. Sights and sounds, the tour of the downtown churches will be on December the 7th from 6 to 8.30, and tickets are $5. And it's a neat way to get to see a lot of the downtown churches and also um, to hear different music venues. So our praise band's going to be doing that. Um, so that's kind of where we are. So uh, then we're having... Senior Fellowship uh, Candle Lighters will be meeting on December the 7th, and the Johnstown Johnnies will be present and present the program. Um, and so if you'd like to come, sign up on the connection card so they know how much lunch to make. So if you would do that. Up for um, Chapel Bible Study is an unlikely advent, extraordinary people of the Christmas story by Rachel. Phillips is a study with themes of joy, hope, peace, and joy. And the study will be offered from December the 13th through January. Um, sign up on the connection card if you're interested. And there's the pastor's Bible study. It's mine, this pastor. Um, and we're going to have a Bible study on Monday night at 6.30. It's from The Chosen, and it's... Um, a special piece of the chosen. We will see part of the nativity, but um, there will be Bible study along the way. Uh, the first lesson is going to start about the lineage of Jesus and how it starts with uh, Rahab and so the women in the lineage. lineage. So not Lent, lineage. Um, and so um, come and be a part and see some of their beautiful piece from the chosen. Our baptism folks, our um, neighborhood folks, and I'm not sure they're going to come. 
um, they did say that they were, uh, they forgot and they were on the way and the text I just got while I was doing announcements said, can we reschedule? So we'll see, let me text back and we'll go from there. So um, let's stand and sing together. May be seated. Also, one of the announcements I forgot to tell you is that we are doing a card ministry, and out in the, in the gathering space are cards to be signed. Um, that's going to go on every Sunday from now on. So if you would just remember to stop by the table and sign the cards that go out to the different people, their names are on top. The names are not to people so much that there's something wrong or something going on. It's to say hello, um, to just to brighten somebody's spirits, to let them know that they are connect, need, they are not forgotten and connected to, to the uh, congregation. So please sign the cards out there. Gracious and loving God, um, we thank you that you love us, and that you care for us. We thank you that you reach out to us on many levels. We thank you that in our world where we have schedules and things to do, you remind us that you are with us always and that you are on your own schedule and not ours. And so we can trust in you. Lord, we, we ask that um, you be with us and help us to be reminded that you are always there. Lord, we 
pray for those that had families and thankfulness uh, that they had families to go to over this holiday weekend. And we pray for those who didn't have families to go to. Um, we pray for those who had happy times and thank you for that. And for those that had division within their families, we, we pray for them as well, that they might know a peace and that your family, um, our family of God, would be one where they can know and feel like they belong. We come to you, Lord, praying for those that need your healing power and strength. And we ask that you be present to them in ways that they know that you were there. And we also lift up, Lord, those who um, have lost loved ones or those that are mourning in any way, um, whether it's the estrangement of family or just any way, Lord. Um, please just let, hold, your, hold them in your arms and let them know that you are there, never leaving them or forsaking them. And we thank you, Lord, for your love and your great love to us through your son, Jesus. And we ask, Lord, that you will be with us as we pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. scripture reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. I have to change my first line because I think I about gave Barb a heart attack at the first service. I started by saying, well, I've been the pastor here, a pastor here for about a little over a year and a half. And then her eyes got real big. Many more, I hope, will follow. Because usually when we start a sermon that way, it goes somewhere different. It's usually, well, the bishop said, I hope the bishop doesn't call me. Me too. I'm saying that because time has flown. This has 
been the shortest year and a half at a church that I can remember, which is a good thing. That means, you know, you all mostly have your act together. <laughs> because at other churches, a year and a half has seemed like forever. So I was thinking this week about the past year and a half and the many reasons why I am grateful to be here at First Church. First on the list is we survived that nonsense. And I can stop my list there. We survived, well, this nonsense out on fifth, and then that nonsense we still have to survive people learning how to drive the weird egg-shaped roundabout, but we'll get there. God will make a way, that's what we sing, right? <laughs> it's reason enough, really, to be grateful that, that this church kept going when you couldn't get here, you couldn't figure out how we were supposed to make it to church on any given day because they kept changing things on us and, and ministry kept happening and worship kept happening. And it didn't really impact us at all. In fact, I think we had more participation in stuff going on at the church through the construction than we had before, which is amazing. And it's a reason to be grateful. Another reason I'm grateful for serving here at First Church is some of the many amazing people in this congregation, people who, who have a deep faith, people who are, are so prayerful in their lives, people who are thoughtful and are kind, those who look for ways that they can, can help out and can serve others, no matter what the task is, people who care deeply about the community around us. We have amazing music and musicians at both services. We have great small groups and Bible studies. We have people who for me personally, who went out of their way to help me feel connected when I got here and to, to help me feel comfortable in, in a new church, which is a gift for us as pastors. You get the idea, right? I mean, I have more on my list. I could keep going. But there's lots of reasons why I'm grateful for serving in this, in this church. Thinking about that list of things I'm grateful for in serving this congregation made me think about some of the interactions and conversations I've had with folks over the past year and a half. And one that came to mind was a conversation I had recently with someone who stopped me after church one day and, and mentioned that they really appreciate the way that, that I try to teach from the pulpit, because it was after the first service. Um, they talked about how they, they really enjoy my attempt to offer various ideas and insights that, that make us think and make us consider what the Bible is offering us for our lives today. And I really liked that feedback because it's nice to have nice things said about what you're doing. I also think it is true, but it was really nice to just have, have a pat on the back. You know, we all enjoy that from time to time. And, and, and I really appreciated it because I know the hard work that Pastor Barb and I do to try to do exactly that, to offer resources for us as a congregation, to grow in our faith and, and to point out the resource that the Bible is and the gift that it is for us and how when we look at it with open eyes, we can see God speaking and God encouraging us and God challenging us to be better Christians. And then, because this is the way my mind works, I went back and I looked, I looked at what we've preached over the last year and a half, and I did the math. And from the Old Testament, we, we've preached and focused on pa passages from the Old Testament 27.1% of the time. And if you can do the math, that means 72.9% of the time from the New Testament. And because I'm weird and a nerd, and I like numbers. I went and looked at the distribution even broader, and so here, just bear with me. We've preached from the Pentateuch, from the first five books of the Bible, 3% of the time, 
from the prophets, 12%. Likewise, from the, what we call the writings, that's Psalms and Proverbs and Job and Esther and Ruth and Joshua and Judges and First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, those books, 12% of the time. Uh, from the Gospels, 49% of the time. From the Epistles, 23% of the time. And if you've been doing your math, that leaves 1% for Revelation, which we hit. 1% of the time. Now you're wondering why I'm saying all of this. Because Pam is wondering why I'm saying all of this. Sure, it makes sense that I would tell you why I'm grateful to be serving here as one of your pastors. It makes sense, right? It's the Sunday after Thanksgiving. We're, we've been in an, a mindset of thankfulness and gratitude. But why all the numbers? What does any of that have to do with Isaiah? Thank you for asking. I'd love to tell you. In the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, because Isaiah is in the Old Testament, we often encounter God urging the people to see and do new things. If you didn't hear it when Laura read it for us, you can just open it up and find it there. I don't remember the verse, but it's there in Isaiah 43. God is doing this not because the old is bad or is obsolete or is somehow, you know, mis guided. It's because God is always at work. God is always active, and we need to keep up. If we just keep doing the same thing, God's going to keep going, and we're going to be left behind. It's a response to God's grace to find ways to stay active in God's work. We, though, don't always do that. We sometimes get caught off guard, and God is still out there working, and God does something new, and we say, oh, I didn't expect that. We shouldn't really be surprised by God working. It's never unexpected. How it happens, we might not be able to anticipate, but we should anticipate that God is going to do something. God's going to show up in a new way. And people in the Bible made that mistake all the time. I shouldn't actually say all the time because it's not all the time, but it's all the time. You know, more often than not, they were caught off guard because God did something and they didn't expect it to happen. Part of that reason was they focused so much on what had happened, what God had done. They looked to the past and then stayed there. And looking to the past is not a bad thing inherently. It can be a good thing. History, understanding history, can give us good insights about today. If we reflect on where we have been, what we've been through, then we can understand where we are today and how to deal with our present circumstances and even learn how to plan for the future. In fact, God points this out to people. When God speaks through the prophets, a lot of the time the way God introduces himself to them through the prophets is by saying, I'm the Lord your God, the God of your fathers, God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. I'm the God who led you out of Egypt. In this passage, the God who uh, wiped away those chariots, the Exodus. God is reminding them what they've been through and what God has done. And then he says, and look ahead. Pay attention to what's about to happen. They needed to be reminded of the past so that they could understand the future and God's plan for the future. Another place to look, if, in case you don't believe me that there's this connection between the past and the future that God has in store, look in the Psalms. All the, all the time in the Psalms, again, an overgeneralization, God 
It's pointing out to the people, or the people are singing or writing in their hymns and their prayers. Sing a new song. Sing a new song. All the earth. Psalm 33 and Psalm 40 and Psalm 96 and 98 and 144 and 149 and like a dozen more. These tell us, sing a new song, urging us to remember God is doing something new, and so we should pay attention and we should be ready because it's going to happen. So you might as well be ready. But the new thing, the new song, isn't unexpected. In reality, what God wants us to see and what, what the writers in the Bible want us to see is that the new thing that happens is just a new way of us recognizing the promises of God being fulfilled. God's doing the same thing, just doing it in a new way for us to see. And so Isaiah gives us that reminder of this fact. This passage that, that, that we heard this morning comes from what Bible scholars like to call Second Isaiah. If you look, you know, in your Bible, it's just Isaiah. It just says Isaiah 43. We call it Second Isaiah because Isaiah is divided into three parts. First Isaiah is pre-exile. Second Isaiah, air quotes second, is during the exile, prophecies that came during the exile, and then third Isaiah is after the exile. And it's divided this way to focus on the needs the people had at those points in time. Second Isaiah speaks to them, speaks to the people, reminding them that God is with them in this dark time of the exile, that God would eventually lead them out of captivity in Babylon, and that God would send to them the Messiah, that thing we start celebrating next week. And so God is there speaking through Isaiah, pushing them to see the new thing that's about to happen, that God's grace would be with them in a new way for them to see, to see in a new way. God speaks through Isaiah and says, don't remember the former things. Don't consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. See, it springs forth. Don't you perceive it? Don't you see it? Translation, hey, pay attention. A lot of people jumped in the first service because they weren't paying attention, and then I got loud, and I laughed. God's saying, pay attention because something new is about to happen. Something is about to happen, and I want you to be part of it. That new thing was their release from exile, and it was the birth of the Messiah. This was something new. This was something special. It was important enough for God to share with them through a prophet to remind the people that they should stop their wallowing, stop their sorrow and their grief because life was going to change. Something new and exciting was about to happen and they needed to get over their whining so they could be ready for God to show up, for God to act in incredible ways. But sometimes I feel like the church is stuck in a spiritual malaise. I really like that word. We like to point our fingers. We like to misidentify our problems. We generally like to blame anything or anyone else for what's wrong with us, with the world, with the church. 
in general, we as the church like to point those fingers. And then we like to search for the next new thing that's going to solve our, all of our problems and then not actually try to do anything different or not try to give things time to, search, to solve our problems. We're just looking for a new solution without the hard work. Sometimes those solutions are uh, thought up without much effort at thinking a few steps down the road. Sometimes they're imposed on us from outside. Barb's smiling because we get that regularly. Sometimes we just think something different will fix everything. We don't care what the different is. Or, if we're not searching for solutions, we just ignore everything. We just ignore the problem. It'll go away. You just keep on keeping on. Have I hit a nerve yet? We just blame everything else for our problems. Church isn't full on Sunday? It must be because that team up north won and people are laying at home in bed crying. Except if they're Jeff and then they're celebrating. It must be that the kids have sports and they're on Sundays now. Back in my day, they weren't on Sunday. Or it's just because they can stay at home and watch church online, so why show up? Like watching church and participating online isn't showing up. Or maybe there's a new restaurant and your friend said it's got great brunch, so you got to go try it. Or people are out of town. They don't go to church when they're out of town, like there's not a church in every town. Fun fact. There are about twice as many United Methodist churches in the U.S. as there are McDonald's. There's always a line at the drive-thru under those golden arches. Where's the line of people waiting to get in these doors? We have something better than french fries. We don't have an ice cream machine, but it wouldn't always be broken if we did. It's because we're stuck. I, I, I know this might sound harsh, so just stay with me. We've done it to ourselves. For decades, for my whole life, for your whole life, the church has allowed itself to become increasingly irrelevant in the world. People are searching for purpose and meaning in their life. We have it. Why don't we talk about it? Why don't we share it? Because people are looking, and they're going to find something to fill that hole, and generally what they find isn't very good. For them, for their families, for the world. People are looking for a place to belong. You're here because you found a place to belong. Why don't we talk about it? We have these things in abundance, but we've stopped telling the world. If you need anything more to talk about, we've got this thing we call grace and forgiveness and salvation. So why don't we talk about it? Why are there more people kneeling at the altar of the golden arches than at the cross? Why aren't our pews full every week? It's 
because we've forgotten who we are. We focus so much on the past that we forgot what that means. That our primary identity is Christian, not any of these other labels that people wear. Who we are is a follower of Jesus. And that's it. We follow God who loved us enough to come and live and to die for us, to rise from the dead so that we would understand what love looks like. Instead of people in the world hearing about that, What they hear about is the latest church argument or the latest division in churches or the latest church ministry leader to screw up in horrible, horrible ways. We took our status in the community for granted and and we forgot to just keep looking forward. God kept working. This whole time, God's working, reaching people, saving people. We just forgot to tag along. Now, I don't say that to make you feel bad, because there are wonderful ministries that happen here. I say it to point out that we've got work to do. See, and so God's words that we hear from Isaiah They're God shouting at us that he's still at work showing the world the depth of his love, the depth of his grace, and saying, I want you to be a part of this. Our story as Christians, you and me and every other Christian that ever was or ever will be, our story is that of God giving us new opportunities every single day to share the gospel. If you don't believe me, just like go read Acts and you'll see about all of the opportunities that God has given and that God continues to give for us. Somewhere along the line, though, we forgot that we've been invited to be part of that work. This passage from Isaiah tells us to look out for God and to answer God's invitation for us to join in. We need God. Full stop, we need need Jesus. We also need God to help us see the possibilities that exist every day. The possibilities that come out of our faithful response to God's grace. We need God to surprise us with what we already know. Grace, forgiveness, unending love. We need God to surprise us with that so that we might be excited to share it. To be the good neighbor. To offer God's healing and redeeming love to someone who might never have felt love before. We need God to surprise us so that we decide to keep moving forward. It was two weeks ago, I gave you a prayer to to use, right? And handed out little cards that had the prayer printed, and I said, keep this. See, you're so lucky I even wrote it for you. Yes? Yes? If not, I'll give you a new one. I said, hey, maybe just use this through the month of November. Ha, I tricked you. Keep using it. 
think about it. Think about continuing to, to pray that prayer or something similar that you come up with on your own. It doesn't have to be my prayer. I won't be offended. Pray something else. If you haven't started using that prayer, though, consider starting. Ask God to use us to share his grace, to shine his glory into the world. Ask God to help us say yes to the new thing that he's doing. Or to say yes to being a part of the old stuff that he's doing, because that hasn't stopped. God just keeps going. I think it's the best way that we can learn to be surprised by grace. It's by looking for it. We can be surprised by God making a way in the world. God's doing it. The way to be surprised is to look for it happening. You won't be surprised that it happens. You'll be surprised at how amazing it is to be part of God's plan. To be invited to be part of God's family. And all of this just so that we might be able to together praise God. That's what Isaiah says, that, that God is doing a new thing to give us one more chance to praise. Not because we have to, but because we've been invited to. So keep going. Think about what God has done so you can know what to look for tomorrow. And then be surprised by grace because it's going to show up. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, we ask that this week you would help us to see you at work in the world to recognize the plan that you have and our part in it so that we might be able to say yes to you to help us to look forward to the new thing that you are doing the new ways that you are inviting us to share your grace, to share the story of your love that comes to us through Jesus so that wherever we find ourselves today, tomorrow, any day in the future, we might be able to boldly proclaim your name and share your love that knows no end. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.
was that last uh, verse? It, years from now, we'll see the fruit, the fruit our hands have sown. You might not see it, but God does. He's always at work, can be at work through our lives if we let him. So go this week and be surprised by how God might choose to use you if you look for it. Amen.